Hello, hello, hello. You are now experiencing the Entrepreneur Show with Asa Laveau. I am your blissfully queer host, Asa Laveau. And yes, I did say blissfully queer. I decided to reimagine what being in the LGBTQIA plus family meant for me. So rather than thinking that it's a struggle, rather than thinking it's bad or it's a burden, I am reimagining every day, moment by moment, that this is a blissful and divine experience that I would choose again. So now that I've said that, first off, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me into your ears, whether that may be in your car, uh, where you live, your office, while you're doing a run, or maybe even on the train. Thank you for allowing me to share this time uh, with you so that co-creation can take place. I am excited seems so cliche because, but I am about today's uh, guest thing. And so let me find a new word. I am, of course, honored. I have been looking forward to this conversation for about four years. That's when I first reached out to this human, was four years ago, uh, to find out what they were up into the world because I fell in love with, I first fell in love with what they offered and then realized that there was a human worthy of that love once I looked a little bit deeper. And that's what I'm going to invite you to do uh, with me on today. And the reason why, let me first give you a little background about why I'm bringing this human, who is Twiggy Bushi Garçon. The reason why I'm bringing this human to the platform is because with entrepreneurship, there are so many ways to be a queer identified entrepreneur. And that could look like TV. That could look like monetizing the brand that you built when someone once told you that there was nothing there and you create something out of nothing or you find your pocket and you make that work for you and Tuki Pushi Garcon is that that is the epitome of what I am talking about today so I feel that this is a timely conversation um, so don't don't change the channel. Don't go anywhere. You are in the right place at the right time for the right reason. So without further ado, hello, Twiggy. Hello, hello. How are you? Thank you for having me. Of course. There, I have been looking forward, literally looking forward to this conversation for years. So thank you for taking the time. I don't take it lightly or for granted that you are allowing me in your space for just a little while. So again, thank you. Well, it's an honor to share space with you too and to to finally have this conversation years later. So thank you for having me. (laughs) Yes, yes. So um, I don't really like interviews that make it feel like we're on, you know, back in the day, 60 Minutes, 2020, things like that, even though we are living in 2020. So what I would like to do is just ask you some questions so that myself and the person, the third person that's listening with us right now, the three of us can learn more. So the first question that I have for you before we even get started with anything is what's the best way for someone to love you? For someone to love me personally? Personally, uh, like if someone wanted to love Twiggy, and we're yeah. not talking about romance, we're talking about loving you, the person. How do they show up for you? What does that mean? What does that look like, smell like, feel like for them to agree that, okay, yeah, I want to love this human? Yeah, it looks like I'm passionate, it smells like bliss, and it feels like joy. Um, consistency is a way to love me communication is a way to love me affection is a way to love me um physical touch is a way to love me those particular last two are my love languages <laughs> okay. um, and and so like whether it's romantic or platonic i am extremely um keen on like affection physical touch and quality time um mm-hmm. and um and so those show up 
but yeah, I just, you know, generally speaking, like I know and feel loved when someone is consistent, when they're honest and open with me, um, and when they prove to me that, that I can count on them. Agreed. I love the consistency part. That is something that I invite many more people to allow into their lives is this level of consistency um, for yourself and for others. So now that we kind of understand the feeling of you and how you be in the world, I definitely will not go further without asking you, uh, how do you identify what are your pronouns and actually based on looking at your content, um, the term PGP. So what would that be for you? Uh, my pronouns are she, her, they, them. I identify as queer, non-binary, black, and indigenous. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. So if you don't know any of that, if you're listening in, please do the work <laughs> and go find out what all of that really means so that you can uh, respect her journey while we go through this. And always feel free to send in your questions. So, you grew up in Portsmouth, Virginia, correct? Yeah, I mean, we're country, so we say Portsmouth, but yeah, Portsmouth, Virginia. <laughs> Same city Portsmouth. as Missy Elliott. Oh, nice. I love Missy. I totally love Missy. So, what was it like to be incubated in Portsmouth, Virginia? Um, Portsmouth is a small um, city. It is um, in the same way that New York has five boroughs, but it's one city. The area I'm from is called Hampton Road, um, but it's actually seven cities. Mm. Um, Portsmouth is the smallest of those cities, so, um, I mean, it doesn't even take you 30 minutes to get from one side of town to the other. Um, so it's very small, only three high schools, um, mixed as far as, like, race and culture is concerned, um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's southern. It's the southern part of Virginia. It's just shy, uh, just a little bit north of North Carolina, maybe 45 minutes north of North Carolina, and um, and has all the um, as many of the um, as many beautiful things as it has problematic things. Growing up there um, was um, rough. Uh, I had a lot of um, femphobic and homophobic experiences growing up, and and middle school and high school and um yeah and I grew up I come from partially religious family but um I was like sort of deeply rooted in the Christian church for most of my childhood um so yeah that that's a that's a picture of Portsmouth good food southern hospitality Mm -hmm. um but also, you know, it's 2020. I haven't lived there in 13 years, so I'm quite sure it's different now. Correct. I, I, of course, I'm sure it is. And you talk about the food, and I've watched your, uh, especially your Twitter feed, and so it seems like you know a little bit about that, but we'll get back to that a little bit later. So, what you said, you talked about the duality of Portsmouth, and, you know, there are problematic things, and then there's things that are wonderful. Is there a person or an experience uh, in your early years there that really just gave you hope, joy, possibility? Is there an experience or a person that really made that a reality for you? Yeah, absolutely. I would say the first of those is um, my first gay father or chosen father. Um, His name was Antonio, but we all called him Cut Punch. Um, and I met him when I very first came to the bar scene in 2004. Um, and he believed in me and like anything I wanted to do so much more than so many people had prior to meeting him. Um, and really pushed me to leave Virginia to, you know, follow the career, um, path that I wanted and to, um, going to move into New York and going to FIT and, um, you know, if it had not been for him. I I'm probably would have thought that New York wasn't even a possibility for me. So um, all of that to say, like, he would be the person I would, I would, I would shout out. And he has since passed, so rest in power to him. Yes, rest in power to him. So can you say uh, his name one more time? Yeah, his name is Antonio. But Antonio. we call him, yeah, but we call him Cut Punch. <laughs> Cut, <laughs> Cut Punch, okay. I want to continue calling him Cut Punch because that's just fun. Um, so with Cunt Punch, 
how did you how did you all connect? And I asked this question because being a queer identified person of color in Oklahoma, which is where I'm from and where I live, to find a quote unquote gay father, gay dad, a chosen, that seems totally out of the realm of possibility for me and the people that are closest to me. We don't have experiences like that. So how did you go on that journey of finding him? Uh, it was kind of uh, sort of like a series of situations that happened organically. Um, in high school, I danced at a dance, their local dance studio. And um, one of the people at the dance studio went to my same high school. And he's actually one of the only openly gay people at my high school. And I wasn't out at this particular time yet and um he would both the Tony technique classes and um i wasn't in the barroom scene yet but there's this sort of adjacent community that exists in the dmv area called the model troop scene and i had been doing that so i knew of him through high school he knew of me through the model troop scene and um when i finally figured out what vogue was and what the barroom scene was he <clears throat> invited me to my first ball um and uh a part of the journey to that first ball was meeting antonio for the first time and uh, they took me to my first ball together. And very shortly after, you know, couldn't have been two months before Antonio was like super protective and like my dad. So um, that's the quick and dirty of it all. That's how we met. Can you tell me what that's like? Because I have, I, based on our communication since 2016, there's just a little bit of communication you may know that I've been looking to go to a ball for years now. I came very close to a semi-ball when I was in. But what I would, yeah, I just want to know what that's like. We don't have those in Oklahoma or a lot of places in the Midwest and places where I visited. So can you tell me what that was like that very first day or night that you walked through that place and experience those things well there is a small scene there in kansas city that's not going right yeah um it's very small and they only have balls like like i would say like many ball deluxes maybe like once a year but um yeah i mean ballroom is so different everywhere you go while the like format and structure of it is, is uh, very similar if not the same everywhere you know there's regional and cultural nuance to like the people to how they execute the categories. Um, so it's a bit different. I think, you know, Virginia is, is a smaller, has a smaller ballroom community, a smaller thing, so everyone knows each other. Um, but all the while, it's still like black and queer and and expressive. And, you know, that first ball for me was the, the most um, black and brown queer trans people I had ever been around at that time. And it was so much to take in. Like it, I can vividly remember different different aspects of the night, and it was just a lot to take in. Um, but also, it was so high adrenaline that um, you know I just never forget it. Sounds nice. And thank you for breaking that down a little bit. And because I'm, I'm looking forward and counting down the days to me finally <laughs> experiencing that for myself, but thank you for that. And something else that you had talked a little bit about, about you, the, the religious aspect of Portsmouth that you grew up with, would you say that that religious paradigm that you grew up with had an effect on you now being a healer? And even to the point of, you know, your friends nicknaming you Oracle, which if you watch The Matrix, you know what Oracle is. Do you feel like that had a significant catalyst to that? Or do you feel like it was in spite of it? No, I think definitely it's all all connected and in alignment. I think, you know, while I don't subscribe to Christianity now, I'm still an extremely spiritual person. And I think that was the basis of me learning um, what spirituality was at the time. And so... Um, by all means, like my healing work now, the nickname that people give me have given me the or like it, it's it is entirely connected to to my upbringing in the, in the Christian church. And I would offer that um, you know when I was uh, first coming into the scene, 
not too long before I met um, Sherrod, or Shushu, as we call uh, him back at home. But not too long before I met um, Shushu, I had been asked to leave my church back at home. Um, well, pretty much given an ultimatum that I needed to, like, switch it up and be more masculine and, uh, and you know, a, a bunch of other things that were not who I, who I am, who I, who I was, or who I am. Um, and so rather than, you know, being kicked out, I left on my own. And um, and it wasn't even, I don't know, couldn't have been six months before I met Shushu and discovered the ballroom scene. And um, and I think the ballroom scene for many folks, not, not you know, this isn't exclusive to me. It's like a life-saving community. It is, um, you know, the place where we learn how to express ourselves, learn who we are, um, who uh, we find and discover our families. Um, and oftentimes, you know, I, I compare not, you know, clubs and balls and, and that part of the Black queer experience. It, it's like it is a ministry. It, you know, the call and response, the DJ and the commentator, the reaction from the person on the floor performing or dancing. Um, it is in and of itself like its own sort of um, church experience, if you will. It's a very spiritual and sacred space. Okay, that makes total sense. And thank you for breaking that down. Now, spirituality, the spiritual part of you, the oracle uh, portion of you, does that, is that like a baseline for your, everything else that that you're doing in your life, such as the activism, the advocacy, being a producer, being a choreographer, is the spirituality part of you your foundation? Or is it more like a braiding of part of you? then spirituality is just one part of that braid. No, I would say the spirituality of it um, is, is um, the, the thread through the braid is, is purpose, right? And that purpose is directly com- um, connected to, to my spirituality and my spiritual practice. And so I think, you know, while producing an entertainment, maybe one strand, you know, one group of hair in that braid and it might be another group of hair in that braid, um, my spirituality and my purpose is the, is the third one that, that sort of connects it all for sure great and let's since I, I'm going there we're talking about the activist piece uh, with spirituality I first learned about you through a documentary that you um, executive produced and you, uh, you've co-written it as well correct? yeah I wasn't an EP but I was the co-writer yes I apologize. So yes, you co-wrote uh, the Kiki or the Kiki documentary, which um, I even saw that it's on Hulu now. So if you if you don't know about this yet, if you're listening, please, please, please go watch it today. It really is good. So I learned about you through that, and I definitely saw you as an activist and an advocate, um, and from a voyeurist point of view and objection point and outside looking in it almost seemed like you were more activist um, advocate than you were entertainer or ball even though you're a ball legend it seemed like you were more you were giving us more of that energy and what I would like to know is within your activism and your advocacy how do you see that within LGBTQIA world, especially as a, um, a person of color, and what I let me rephrase that because that was a lot. <laughs> I now that I listened to it, that was a lot. All right, so you are an activist and advocate for queer identified people of color, definitely, and especially those who have uh, challenges getting housing. Within that activism, is that a label? that you care to have or is that just someone naming something that you will always be because sometimes I feel that within our world this one world that we share as far as being people of color and queer identified that people just want to be advocates they want to be activists they want to be advocates but they don't want to go in it with just saying you know here's another title on my resume or another title in my Instagram bio. What does it mean to actually do the work of activism and advocacy within our culture? Yeah, I think there's that's an interesting question. Thank you for that. There's some there's an interesting like 
perspective uh, around like advocacy and activism. And I think, you know, while an advocate like publicly supports and, um, and, and raises awareness around and brings attention to a cause or an issue and an activist sort of like, it, you know, has a bit more of like a grassroots organizing connotation to it. I find myself somewhere in between both. Um, and for me, like, it's just that, you know, the use of the word is really around, like, to try and help get people to just understand. But where I situate myself in all of it is really around um, centering folks with any lived experience or expertise um, as the experts of, of a given thing. And so when I think about entertainment, my work around co-writing Kiki and even consulting on Pose is, is around, like, making sure that Ballroom is centered in the creation of, of both of those projects. Um, my work in nonprofit at True Colors United um, is a large part around making sure that young people with lived experience of homelessness are centered in creating solutions around that issue. And so um, some of those days look like advocacy and like using the platform I have to like raise awareness or attention to the thing. Other days it looks like grassroots organizing and coming up with a campaign or like actually doing direct action and marching. Like, so it, it's a bit of a, of a mix of, of both things. That makes so much sense to me. Thank you for that. And I don't want to gloss over the need of the work that you're doing or the position that you have uh, with True Colors United. So let's just say that there is a person of color, a queer identified person, and they are having issues with finding uh, housing they are homeless right now. I have been homeless, so I know that feeling. So if this is them and they're listening somehow, some way right now, or they're even on the verge, are there things that you can help them do or think or like how does it I think it the answer now? to that question is a lot more complicated than answering on on, on, on this call. There's Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a lot more nuanced than that, um, and it also depends on so many different factors: how old they are, where they are. Um, is it re- is it a city place? Is it a um, a rural place? Is it so? It's a lot more difficult to to answer that, and and I'm like, what would they do right now in this moment, sort of way? Um, because that would vary depending on their circumstances. There, there, I couldn't give you like a like a one size sort of answer to that question. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a bit like layered and nuanced of what what will be the next step for them, um, and, it, and it's complicated. I've also been been experienced street homelessness and couch surfing, and um, and yeah, even from my own experience, different situations, I had to make different decisions on what was next. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yes, and you are you are totally correct. It is nuanced. Everyone's position or everyone's experience. Um, is not like everyone else's and it really does matter how old you are what you're if you're fleeing from something if you're working if you have a totally. skill yes totally. all of that all yeah. of that means something so i uh i don't want to leave people you know like up in the air with it what a good because i went to the site i went to the true colors united website and it seemed like there was so much um available so yeah is the website a resource yeah yeah, the okay. website is definitely a resource. Um, our work is not in, in what you're referring to, which is direct service provision. We are not mm-hmm. a direct service provider. We're an international advocacy organization, a training institute. And so what we do is um, training and education and technical assistance, which is like fancy language for like, we teach people who provide services how to make those services affirming for LGBTQ young people and black and brown young people. Um, and we also teach them how to include young people in creating um, both organizational solutions to homelessness and community-wide solutions to homelessness. Um, and then our advocacy and public policy work, we make sure that like programs that are funded by federal dollars don't discriminate against LGBTQ young people or turn them away at the door. Um, and that looks like a bunch of like wonky policy regulation stuff that we do on the Hill. Um, and then the way that we do work directly with young people experiencing homelessness or who have experienced housing instability, um, it's leadership development programs. And, and there's two in particular, one where young people work with our staff at the organization on actual True Colors project. And then another where young people, um, uh, up to 25 young people at a time 
um, up to two year term. Actually, we work with them on national policy and local practice. Um, so we bring them together for trainings throughout the year. Uh, we bring them to the Hill. We bring them to state legislation sessions. Um, and work on them, like, actually being in the room, helping to decide what steps. Understood. That was such a good uh, explanation for somebody like me. I wanted to know, and I had been looking, but that was a perfect explanation. Um, With your work with True Colors United, you've had years of that. Would you be able to share with me a time with the organization, with the work that you're doing, that was your aha moment. So a time when you felt like, you know what? This is why I'm doing this work. This is why it matters. Do you have an experience like that? Hmm. I mean, I think I came to the work with that experience. I think my aha moment may have been, might have, might have been before coming to True Colors. My work prior to, my obviously work prior to, to working at True Colors was in public health. And I worked on a contract that specifically targeted um, the house and barroom community, um, but the correlation between substance use and um, HIV and AIDS serial conversion. So, like, the, if 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 it is true that folks who are like high on substances like have higher inhibitions and like do more things that are quote unquote less physically protective, like what is that correlation? So, I worked on a grant that did that work prior which was very meaningful, but also like burned me completely out. Um, And I wanted to do work around an issue that I had like lived experience. Like I have have had housing, experienced housing instability in childhood. I've experienced housing instability multiple times in adulthood. Um, And I wanted to switch gears from like directly providing services to like um, a different type of work um, where I could open the door for people with with living this experience to like be in rooms that they weren't in before. And so when I realized that this opportunity was what it was, like that was the aha moment. So before I would say coming to True Colors was that moment. That makes sense. And you know, that, I, I can see how um, an aha moment could be the catalyst um, of going into your work. So thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah that totally. Okay, so that now that I understand that, how do you still keep your your not hunger but your 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 level of effectiveness with being an activist, being an advocate, and still we see you and we're proud of you because you know you're doing things like um, the last year at the Met Gala, or the day after, the day before, there was a a ball that you were actually sitting next to Anna to or not next to, but on the same um, same seating as Anna Wintour, the editor of Vogue. And so you're doing things like that and you're going to Met Gala events because, yes, I followed you when that happened. And you, of course, are a, you were a, um, a consultant and now you're a co- choreographer on the FX show Pose. How do you live in both of those places at the same time and not feel bad about either? I mean, it's a struggle. Imposter syndrome is such a real thing where, like, you come out of your, um, you know, become somehow even remotely separated from your struggle and and start to begin to experience a bit of success in some capacity or another and and there is guilt and there is like am I supposed to be here and there is um you know am I making people proud did I let people down it's just like what I'm supposed to be doing like all of those things happen and so you know frontward face that I may look fab in that Gucci outfit on that red carpet that day but that doesn't mean that like before, during, and after that moment, I wasn't like struggling to figure out if it was where I was supposed to, where I was supposed to be and what I was supposed to be doing. Um, that's a constant struggle, uh, and yeah. So it, it, it's not just that both things coexist because you know we don't live single issue or identity lives, and so I can have this duality where I'm doing both. Um, I'm learning that, but it doesn't mean that there aren't moments and days where I'm like questioning that. That makes such good sense. I'm so glad you talked about the imposter syndrome because um, with showing, you know, queer identified entrepreneurs what life can be like, 
the imposter syndrome oftentimes shows up for them. It definitely has shown up for me um, because you sometimes compare yourself and we understand that comparison is the thief of all joy, but you still sometimes do it and you feel like your light isn't as light lit as someone else's. So thank you for uh, bringing awareness and just adding language to that because I feel like a lot of people can really understand and empathize with that. Yeah, thank you. For real. So with, of course, with Pose, we have to talk about it. Um, And I want to talk about it. And the reason why is um, I, I'm sure that it's highly likely that you're gonna, you've heard what I'm about to say to you. Um, Pose made me cry in a way that This Is Us couldn't. And the first time that I did was unexpected. It was during the first season and it may have been show two or three. And it was when, um, and now because I'm talking to you, I don't remember the character names. <laughs> so it's the, um, the individual who's the dancer. Jamal? Uh, Damon. Is Damon. the character? Damon yeah. is the character, yes. Uh, so Damon's character, and he finds someone who wants, who's interested in him. And Yeah, Ricky. Mm-hmm. Ricky, there we go. Thank you so much. I so apologize. So we have Damon and Ricky, and they are, un- it looks like they're not in an abandoned warehouse, but they're it, they're in a place where it's just, they're having an isolated moment. And the way that I saw two black bodies embracing in a way that has been energetically told to me that that can't be real and that that can't happen and that's not right and that's not good and that will never happen. Like all of those things melted away the moment their lips touched. And it's been moments like that throughout the show that I've had and I'm sure others have had. And so I talk about that because I would love to know what impact the show has had for you. Yeah, I mean, it's tons of moments like that for me um, throughout the seasons of the show and, and not just the seasons. I think I think the one of the, the two moments I'll highlight are the first time I saw the first episode of the show, which was at a private premiere that um, the cast and crew were invited to impress and that sort of thing. Um, and that I cried then um, because I hadn't, while I work on it, I, I hadn't seen it yet. Um, and to see that we did it and I was proud of it made me very emotional. And then, um, you know, I think what one of the things that, that doesn't come up often in like these conversations or even conversations just broadly, it's like being in a position like this, that the level of pressure, um, like from, myself I, I'm gonna own it as my own pressure like internal pressure to like make my people proud like make my community proud um you know it is uh I don't quite have a word to describe how intense that pressure feels a lot uh, often and um and the first when the first episode aired I was in the airport about to board a plane to London <clears throat> and um and right when the episode was ending, I, I was like boarding the plane, like on the jet bridge. And by the time I got to my seat, my phone just like flooded with text mm-hmm. messages from people. And I cried for like the first three hours of the flight. Just like could not contain myself with the positive response that um, my loved ones in the community had to it. And so um, I'll never forget those two moments. So the two moments that made me feel like, oh, I think we got it right. And, um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Like, that, that's something I haven't found <laughs> while researching you. I haven't found that story. So thank you. I feel honored that you shared that uh, with us 
today. And while we talk about polls, I actually put forth on social media if anyone would like to ask you questions about the show. And so I have three. I have three questions about the show, um, if you'll indulge me. From Oh, great. The first question is from Dawn. She says, which episode was the hardest to choreograph and which actor had the most surprising ballroom skill? Huh, well, I never got asked that before, so I actually don't know. I, I, you know, I'll, answer, I'll answer, answer that question the best way I know how. I couldn't point to a specific episode that was difficult to choreograph. What I can say is the most difficult moment to choreograph is when... I don't get to see the sides, like the script to the scene I'm choreographing until oh. I get to set that day, which happens. Um, and so, like, I will get sides. Like, I will walk on to set, like, a, and have to do rehearsal in 30 minutes. I have to just get in the sides. And so, like, sort of, like, making it up in that moment, it, it can be challenging and difficult. Um, the thing that makes it, you know, sort of beautifully balanced about that is that most if if not very close to all of the people who actually you see like walking the categories, like the actual competitors, the majority of them are from the actual ballroom community. Um, mm. And so it, it, it relieves some of that pressure because I know I can show this person once or twice and they got it and they'll make it their own and they'll own it and out. And then from that point, it's less chore- like formal quote unquote choreography, like step by step and, and more movement coaching from that point. So um yeah, hopefully that answers that question. What was no, the second part of the question? <laughs> uh, that, no, that was a really good response. And the second part was, which actor had the most surprising ballroom skill? Surprising ballroom what? Skill. Oh, skill. Uh, I don't know that I'm surprised by anyone in particular. I think because... You know, the girls got moves, the thing. Like, the girls know, you know, the girls know how to move. So, right, they do. Yeah. Okay, good. So the second question uh, comes from Lamika. She asks, how do you keep up with the ballroom dances to ensure the scenes are authentic? And, I, and after she asked the question, I started thinking about that too. Because with your schedule, do you still compete? and still go as often as you might like to or as often as you've done. And then because of your the, the demand on you, like how do you know if something is a hit or if you're up at a possibility of getting chopped or does that just mean because you are in fact the legend you are, you just know? Yeah, I mean, several answers to different parts of that question. To the first part around um, authenticity. I mean, there's a team of us. I'm not the only choreographer. I'm the runway choreographer. So I specifically do the runway categories and then the non Vogue um, categories. And then Laomi is the Vogue choreographer. And then every once in a while, uh, Jose Extravaganza will choreograph and Slim has also choreographed. So there's a team of us that, that all do the choreo. All of us are from the ballroom scene. Um, uh, I'm a legend. <laughs> I've walked, walked well for 16 years um Naomi's an icon Jose is an icon um so we have with each of us at minimum 16 15 16 years of, of ballroom experience um so there's that um and when it comes to um when it comes to uh that I think that answers that person's question mm-hmm. and then to, to your question uh I, I i don't get to compete often however uh i'm the overall overseer of a house which means like um think of it like executive director of a nonprofit. like i have a board of founders and over and like overall um leaders who like i report to but basically like it's my job to run the house and um and so that that take, you know I don't really have a lot of free time like a, between True Colors, whatever entertainment project I'm working on, whether it's Pose or working on a doc or like whatever the thing is, and then like actually running the house, I don't get to compete very often because my time at Balls is spent like getting my kids and my members ready or working on a production or judging. Um, so I don't actually get to compete often, and I'm looking forward to when outside opens back up <laughs> so that I can make another moment. I totally. <laughs> totally understand that and I don't even want to imagine <laughs> what your days are like but I will I, I, I may ask about that though 
Um, the third question comes from Carmen, and she asks, what has surprised you most about how the show's audience has connected to Ballroom? One story, and I don't tell this story often either, but um, I have a very close uh, chosen family member who used to be a member of my, well, I guess he's an honorary member of my house. He just doesn't watch balls. He doesn't compete anymore. Who, um, throughout his time in ballroom, was like in school, was a nurse, and then like now he's a doctor, and shared with me that he was struggling with one of his um, HIV positive patients on retention, meaning like to stay on their meds and take them consistently. And this person watched the show and this person like was so inspired by how it resonated with them that their retention increased and they started to take their medicine consistently wow. and and so that has been the sort of like biggest gag for me um from hearing how the show resonates with people um so yeah oh that's yeah that'll take you out here for sure that's yeah, thank you for sharing that as well. So, um, we are just about wrapping up, but there are a few things I definitely would like to know your thoughts on. So, we looking into balls and um, all of those different things, I think it's common to say that these began in Harlem, and I believe like in the 19... 19- some people say 1920s, and some I've heard some say 1960s. What would that be for you? Uh, Harlem drag balls began in the 20s during the Renaissance. Um, and, and I think the sort of thing to make clear about that differentiation is that these were Harlem drag balls, which were more like uh, what today's pageants are like. Mm. And in the 1960s, uh, sort of like after this, if you followed, if you ever seen this documentary called The Queen, you see Crystal LaBeija storm off after losing to a white queen. And subsequently, uh, shortly, a few years after, it started the first house, House of LaBeija, and other houses followed suit. And then you see the sort of like transition from drag ball to house ball. So I need to see that. <laughs> because I did not even know that existed. Uh, so thank you for telling me about that. And the reason why I ask is because looking into this, preparing for our conversation in this moment, I found a person by the name of, let me find out their name, William Swan. Are you familiar with William Dorsey Swan? Mm. I'm really bad with names. No problem. So the reason why I asked that name is because I started researching balls and looking at how far back they went. I found an article that was written about this individual um, because they had a raid on their house in the year yeah. 1800, right? Yep, yep, yep. 1888. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah. um, are you kidding me? They were doing yeah. a, a form. Well, not a form. To them, that was their ball. They dressed up um, and paraded themselves around in a safe space. And then they actively resisted uh, the police that came in that raided the house. So I just wanted to share that with you because I didn't know if you knew. Because I was like, when I found that out just last night, I was like, this is amazing. Yeah, I have heard this story. When you, as soon as you uh, you said the name for it, and it just uh, sat for a little bit, and I, I do recall, yeah, yeah. And the reason, I guess, the reason why another another reason why it's so impactful to me is that this idea um, that somehow or another, while we are reimagining what it means to be black after the Civil War, after the Emancipation Proclamation. And that there's this energy about reimagining what it means to be black. We don't have any stories, like real stories, about what it means for a black person in America to reimagine their queerness after being owned and told what they can and cannot do. And so that possibility resonated with me in a large way and then made me think about this question for you is... What do you feel is the story that you were meant to tell with everything that you've been a part of and are being 
and are part of. Yeah, what is the story that you would love to let people know? Um, do you mean like a particular moment in life, like a story I tell, or like what is the story, like a legacy, like what I, what I want my legacy has to be? I kind of desire both. <laughs> I, desire, I desire both responses. I want to know in your life, like what is the story that we should leave knowing about Twiggy, but then also, okay, in this in this understanding of what it means to be indigenous, a person of color. Uh, to walk a category of Butch Queen European runway and all of these facets of who you are and what you've seen and what you've been a part of, what is the, even, it might not be the ultimate story, it could just be the next story that you wish to tell. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would be my own. I I grew up in the South. Uh, Like you said, I'm Black, I'm Indigenous, I'm queer, I'm non-binary, I'm femme, I... I hold all these different layers and identities and I was told that I couldn't and shouldn't be the way that I am and told that I, you know, you know, being a part of ballroom would, would, um, nothing would come of it. I would never be able to put it on a resume. And, um, and I said, fuck all of that. And Mm -hmm. I dreamt it and I thought it and I said it and I did it. And now my life is and will continue to serve as a possibility model for anyone who was told that they couldn't and shouldn't be who they are. Indeed. And that leads seamlessly into my last question for you, which is how, like, give me, I want proof, I want language of how, in fact, you are your ancestors wildest dream yeah I think that things that my ancestors could only dream were true or or possible Um, only and only on their backs have I been able to actualize and only like through honoring them and constantly reminding myself of 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 that fact that I, that I, you know, sort of stand on their, not sort of, but I absolutely stand on their shoulders, um, and rooted myself in that, in that honor, um, have become the actualization, the manifestation of those dreams. And I agree. And as someone who shares this space called life, uh, with you, I will say, uh, publicly, that you are necessary. There are those of us who are watching you and we thank you for every tear you've cried silently, every (laughs) snooze you did not hit on your alarm clock to show up for someone um, to create an experience. We thank you. Thank you, thank you for being you um, at all times, rather, whatever that looks like in the moment. I'm not saying thank you for being the epitome and the best of us. No, I'm saying even in the times when you don't feel like you are the best version of you, thank you for still existing um, because you have definitely made an impact um, in this world. If you do nothing else, you have definitely done that for most of us, including myself. So thank you. Thank you. That's extremely, extremely kind and gracious, gracious of you to say. Thank you. No worries. And with that, uh, this has been um, an episode with Twiggy Pushy Garcon. I am your divinely queer host, Asa Laveau. Thank you for co-creating this moment in time. And as always dreams and blessings.